Welcome back, everyone. This is The Change Log, and I'm your host, Adam Stachowiak. This is episode 170, and today we're joined by Ben Johnson. And when I say we, I mean Jared, because Jared went solo on this show, and he was joined by Ben to be schooled on BoltDB, InfluxDB, and several other key value store databases out there. And Ben also shared why he's so passionate about developing open source software. We have three awesome sponsors for the show, CodeShip, a longtime supporter, and two brand new sponsors, Imagix and Casper. So huge thanks to each of them for supporting the show. Our first sponsor is CodeShip. They've launched a brand new feature called Organizations. You've heard me talk to you about it before, but now you can create teams, set permissions for specific team members, and improve collaboration in your continuous delivery workflows. You can maintain centralized control over your organization's projects as well as teams with this brand new feature. And you can save 20% off any plan you choose for three months by using our code, the Change Law Podcast. Once again, that code is the Change Law Podcast. So get 20% off any plan you choose from CodeShip for three months. Head to codeship.com slash the Change Law to get started. And now on to the show. Welcome back, everyone. Jared here. I am joined today by Ben Johnson. Ben is a Denverite. I think that's what they're called. <laughs> is it Denverite? Is that the term yeah. for someone from Denver? Okay. Yeah, we're Denverites. Yeah, so Ben's a Denverite. <laughs> uh, we met Ben out at GopherCon back about a month ago now. Um, he is, describes himself as an open source software developer who specializes in uh, customer behavior analytics and data visualization. He's also big into distributed systems and uh, data stores. Ben, uh, welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. So, uh, out at GopherCon, it seemed like your name kept coming up all over the place. <laughs> um, very active in the Go community, very active in kind of the new wave data store community. Um, why don't you tell me a little bit about yourself, how you got here, and what you do? Yeah, sure. Uh, so, I've been... Writing software for about 15 years now. Uh, I started out as a, an Oracle DBA back in the day and kind of moved into web development and uh, yeah, just kind of jumped around, started getting into open source, I don't know, four or five years ago, uh -huh. and somehow just kind of landed inside the, the data database world um, through just a lot of turns and, and whatnot. So uh -huh. uh, yeah, just I love writing uh, open source, so I do well, a lot of it in my free time. Well, yeah, what did, what initially drew you to open source as a thing? What excited you? Um, I think I think the idea that you could put something out there and that it not only helps people, but you mm -hmm. also you know people give you feedback and you get a kind of you just learn so much as soon as you put out software. Everyone will either love what you have or tear you apart, or you know, there's all this like learning, even if it is kind of hard. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah. I try to do a little bit of exploration just to find out more about you online. Um, ben B. Johnson on Twitter, if anybody's interested out there. Notice you don't seem to have a website. You apparently are a consultant of some kind. Uh, you do have a LinkedIn. I found that. But mm -hmm. uh, you seem to be focused on your GitHub and your Twitter, and that's about it. Can you tell me about your business side and your consultancy and kind of how that all works? Uh, sure. Uh, yeah, I work with um, InfluxDB. Uh, so it I work with them and just write uh, a lot of the storage layer and the distributed systems parts okay. of, uh, of that database. So I've been, yeah, that's, that's where I work for during the day. Okay. And um, yeah, and just kind of, I've consulted in the past and uh, I used to work at Shopify for a while. So just kind of hopped around here and there. Right on. So you're focused on Influx uh, at the moment. Mm -hmm. Well, we have you on the show because we, we want to talk about databases and... Um, seems like for a long time there was kind of you know your set of uh relational databases and then there was these these niche things out there that you heard of uh these document stores or column stores <laughs> i remember um in the area that i worked there was actually a database called cache um i don't know that one you don't know that one so uh -huh. yeah so it's, it's big in kind of the medical world okay. and also in um uh, financial transactions and whatnot, but it was very niche. So you kind of have these pockets, and then it had you know it has its thing going on. And then you had kind of the NoSQL explosion uh, mm -hmm. a few years back, where you had your Mongos and your Reacts and interest around those. Um, 
And we seem to be having another wave of, of, of new things. And maybe they're not new. They just, I think they're new because I don't really uh, come across them as much. Um, some of which are things that you're, you're involved in, Influx, Bolt. Uh, you emailed me a list of things. I had never heard of half of these. And <laughs> I try to keep up with open source. So it's, it's, it's hard. Yeah, it's hard for sure. But yeah, there's it's... LMDB, LevelDB, uh, Parquet, which I'd never heard of, Cassandra, uh, which is you know coming out of uh, Twitter and, and Facebook was big a little, a little while ago. Um, mm-hmm. Has there been an explosion in data stores, or is that, am I just noticing it? Oh no, it's yeah, it's definitely an explosion. I think people are trying to are starting to realize that once you once you get to a certain scale or a certain use case, like you can optimize at these really low levels, and you start to you know what used to just be an application, and you're going further down. And uh, lower down, you mm-hmm. start to just build your own database at that point. And uh, I think that people find a lot of either um, operational simplicity from having a very specific uh, target mm-hmm. or use case, or they just get a lot of performance out of it. Um, there's all kinds of different reasons to get down that far. I think when the NoSQL uh, movement, we might just call it that, first hit, and I'm not, I can't remember the timing, but maybe it was 10 years. I can't remember how long ago that was. Um, and MongoDB became... Um, kind of a thing that was winning the hearts and minds of developers. Hmm. There was this whole throw out your relational database <laughs> uh, mindset. It seems like now that's kind of shifted, and it's not like throw it away. It's like here's something you can use in addition. Is that how you feel about these types of databases? Yeah, I think a lot of it has to do with you know your requirements, kind of what you know already, where you're coming from. Uh, I think SQL came out of you know back in the '80s. It came out of you know, you had business people that would go up to a terminal and they wanted to be able to write their own queries or, you know, some some level of that. Uh, and then we started trying to fit it into this object model, too. And I think a lot of people have gotten tired of trying to fit the relational and object model together. And mm-hmm. business users, you know, they'll use a web UI now. It's made by a developer. So we don't have that, that direct SQL requirement anymore. Right. But I think that there's not... The NoSQL movement doesn't have enough of a structure. Like, we don't, we make all these databases, but we don't tell people how to actually use them Uh or like what best practices are. So, I think people, we develop these 20 or 30 years of SQL uh, best practices that people go, or I feel like they're starting to fall back on. Uh And they're saying, well, you know, I know how to do that. I'll go back to doing that. This object thing is just, or document database is confusing. Yeah. So, I think if we can actually, do a lot of education around that. I think there's some great use cases for, you know, document databases or key value stores. Yeah, I think key value stores is one where we've definitely seen a lot of activity, um, a lot of options. Mm-hmm. And maybe it's because a key value store conceptually is pretty simple. Um, I don't know. I'm not going to go out and say to implement it is simple because you would know a lot better <laughs> than I do. Uh, that I'm sure there's tons of, of nitty gritty details and, and uh, bumps in that road. Mm-hmm. Um, but man, there sure are a lot of options and it seems like a lot of those options are written in Go. Yes. Yeah, there's been a huge influx. I think, uh, you know, I think part of it is, is just the simplicity of you get something written in Go, you can compile it onto a bunch of operating systems and just distribute it out. Um, you know, a lot of the, the uptake we got at influx has just been people saying, this is really easy to set up compared to, you know, a lot of all, other alternatives that have been around for longer. Uh, it's just, you know, people can get up and running, you know, like, mm-hmm. like uh, they, people don't want to spend their whole day trying to learn one tool. They just want to run a command and have it there. Mm-hmm. So I think, I think Go does that really well. So you have a, uh, one of these fancy new uh, data stores that um, goes <laughs> by the name of, I'm just going to act like an old man and talk about everything as if it's shiny new and <laughs> foreign to me, uh, at least for the first part of the call until you kind of school me on how all these things all work. But, um, Yours is called Bolt, uh, Bolt mm-hmm. DB slash Bolt on GitHub, mm-hmm. and uh, seems to be production ready. Why don't you go ahead and just give us the uh, give us the elevator pitch for Bolt DB? Sure. Um, Bolt DB is a a read optimized store, it's a key value store, and its goals more beyond anything else is just to be operationally simple and to be uh, just have a clean API and have strong transactional support. So. There's a lot of key value stores out there that will give you, you know, maybe it's um, really fast write performance, but the reads are really slow. Maybe you'll get, um, you know, certain other uh, benefits where, you know, it might be it might have a, a crazy API, but it might be, you know, fast. Actually, a lot of key value stores seem to be centered around just being fast, uh-huh. uh, which 
I feel like as computers get faster, you know, I don't feel like, you know, most websites out there aren't getting thousands of hits per second. You know, they're getting right. a hit per second or, you know, somewhere in the tens of hits per second. Mm-hmm. So I think that a lot of people try to, they look for the fastest thing out there because they want everything to be blazing fast and they just forget about all these other, um, like operational side. Yeah, it's kind of the, uh, the, the thought that became a meme with web scale. Yeah, <laughs> back in the day to find out what what is and what is not web scale, and you know the fact of many people's businesses and websites is, um, you know, there's you can count the Twitters and the Facebooks on one hand. Yeah, um, sure, there are other large sites out there. You know, there's the Reddits and and the, the top hundred Alexas, but most of us make our living and and live on the web in, um, in kind of smaller <laughs> smaller uh, less populated uh, yeah. areas. Yeah, for sure, and I. It's interesting to see all the databases that come out from, you know, the Facebooks and the Twitters because they have such different requirements than mm-hmm. 99% of people out there. Um, so I think that, you know, it's interesting to see where where people are, or the databases are coming from and right. how those requirements line up. So it looks like Bolt was uh, 1.0 uh, November of 2014, and it's not... Uh it's it's a bit of a remix because you say it's inspired by Howard Chu's LMDB project. Can you tell us about LMDB, how it inspired Bolt, and then maybe what's different between the two? Yeah, sure. Uh, so LMDB uh, is a great design. I really like uh, what Howard did with that. And uh, what it is is it's basically a B tree. So your your data is structured in this yeah, this B tree that you can access your data and you can write to it. And the, whenever you change a, a leaf inside of your tree. It'll copy all the parents as well and kind of make this new version of the tree. So every change will make this new version, this incremental version, mm-hmm. so that as you're going along, every everything that's reading from that tree will get a kind of a, a snapshot of it and work in a transactional way. And then, you know, as things update along, other readers get their own snapshot of the world. And uh, it, it's really good as far as having great transactional support. You can do great things like operationally mm-hmm. where you can just essentially just copy the file as a backup. And, you know, if you're setting up a website or setting up a, an application, you know, you don't want to have to worry about setting up MySQL and having a repli- replica and doing all this other crazy stuff. You know, you can attach on like a, just a web handler, like a, an HTTP handler mm-hmm. and stream down your database if you wanted to have that option. Like it's, it's three lines of code to do a backup, basically. So certain things like that, it has this very simplistic design as opposed to... Um, there's other there's another type of database called an LSM tree. It's a log structured merge tree, merge okay. tree. And what that is is it it takes these different levels. It'll kind of create keys and values in these uh, in these like sorted blocks, and it'll, each one will be a different file. And then as you get these files large enough, they get compacted, like and written into a new block that's larger. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it takes a bunch of them and makes them into these uh, larger ones that are kind of at different levels. Uh, and those are really good for writes. But operationally, it can be a huge pain because you can end up with hundreds or thousands of files where you have this kind of tough, um, it's kind of tough to snapshot, like just copy a file. It's, it's much more involved than that and how you try to stream that out and stream it in. So operationally, you know, Bolt is, is simpler, although it doesn't have the benefits of a, like a write optimization, like a, something like an LSM does. Hmm. So again, it's kind of right tool for the right job if you have a read-heavy uh situation bolt might be a little bit better fit if it's right heavy than something that uses lsm might be a little better fit yeah for sure and actually a lot of people will they'll ping me on twitter or on github and say bolt is slow or like you know whatever just bolt, like that like hey bolt, bolt is slow pretty much just to say like bolt sucks <laughs> and uh people are so nice yeah and i mean i will just paste them a link to a different database that will probably fit their use case better uh-huh. i feel like people try to if you come across a project where they try to be everything to everyone, it's just, I feel like it's injured years. We should know that there's trade-offs on all this stuff. And, you know, Bolt is not the right tool for probably many projects out there, but it yeah. might be for yours, you know. You know what's funny is we, we just had Thomas Reynolds on the show last week talking about Middleman, which is a static site generator. Completely mm-hmm. different situation, but, um, you know, he's been writing Ruby and JavaScript for years, and uh, we started talking about, you know, programming languages and stuff and i just asked him very pointedly if he's still bullish on ruby and and his answer was very familiar to what you just kind of said here where it's like well there's probably a better tool for a different job that you may you may have and it's like well that was an extremely level-headed answer you know <laughs> yeah and it's like it's funny because you know we all kind of live work and and uh have our interactions on the internet and 
I don't know if it's the written form versus here we are, you and I talking on uh, uh, on Skype. It's like people are very level-headed about these types of things uh, in real life. But when we get on the web, it's just like, you know, bull sucks. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and exactly. We lose all sense of like right tool for the right job, and we're all trying to just build good software. <laughs> and it's like we get yeah. into religious wars over these things. I wonder if it's just that degree of separation or what it is about the Internet that makes us like that. Yeah, no, I, I think it is just the anonymity. Because, I mean, if I go to a conference, no one ever comes up to me and tells me how much it sucks. They say, right. I had this difficulty with performance where, you know, I did this and, you know, and then we right. actually have a conversation about it. Yeah. And then everyone walks away kind of being a little uh, a little more knowledgeable. Right. Yeah, it's just hard to be nasty. Uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Face to face with somebody. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so let's go back to not bolt sucking, but things that it's, <laughs> that it's good at. And it must have a lot of use cases because you do have a lot of adoption. You have a lot of... Uh, other projects that kind of use Bolt um, behind the scenes. Um, I think perhaps the reason is that because it's embedded uh, as opposed to a server type of a setup. Can you talk about the embedded aspect of the database? Sure, yeah. So it's it's just a library that you, you bring into your Go program and then you point out a file and you're basically ready to go. There's there's almost no configuration options. Um, even if you wanted them, you can't you can't really configure the database. Um, and it's a, it's a single file, you know, there's an OS lock on it, so you can only have one kind of attached to that file at a time, uh, as opposed to like a MySQL or Postgres where you have like this gigantic, you know, configuration file where you have to find some tweaks to make. Um, but yeah, so, I mean, from that side, operationally, you know, it's, it's easy to just get it up and running a lot of projects, especially when they're products or like an open source project, you can't make that requirement to say, okay, first you guys got to set up these four services and then configure it here and do all this stuff. Uh, Cause no one, no one wants to go through all that. They don't want to add one more thing to their stack. Mm-hmm. So I think it's, it's found a lot of success from that. And um, you know, I think a lot of times too, another important thing too, that people don't think about is that in a lot of projects, the data store is not your bottleneck. You know, you might have a lot of other processing going on and you're just storing some metadata maybe, or you're transferring across the network or you're, you know, doing all kinds of other things. Right. Um, so from that perspective, you know, if, when performance is an issue, usually the next most important thing is operational simplicity. And just to be able to say, this is a file, this is, I can just deploy it. I don't need to do anything beyond just starting out the program. So I think that goes a long way. Yeah. I agree. Op- operational simplicity absolutely does go a long way. You also kind of focus on uh, API simplicity and mm-hmm. the fact that like this is just a key value store, and that's not a bad thing. That's a good thing, right? <laughs> it's, yeah. It's I mean, you're keeping it simple on purpose. Um, as far as the API is concerned, is it just a matter of you know I put data in with a key and then I get it back out by that key? Is it as simple as that, or is there more to it? It's, I mean, it's essentially that you have things called buckets as well. They're, they're basically like a key space. So uh-huh. you can only have one unique key in a bucket, but you can have buckets inside buckets and you can do some, uh, some interesting things around that. But honestly, I mean, most of the time when I use, use Bolt for an application, I'll treat it almost like the way that I structure like tables inside of a relational database. Okay. I kind of have top level buckets where I might have a customer's bucket or a, uh-huh. uh, you know, whatnot. And my primary key, you know, I have, you have, uh, you can create sequential integers inside Bolt per bucket, where I might have an ID for a user. I can generate it off that bucket and the user's bucket, and then that becomes the key for them. So user one is pointing out this, uh, this encoded data structure for the user. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, really, this, it's not actually that far of a departure from relational databases in that sense. Like you think of, you want to find a user by ID, they just find their ID and look them up. Um, you, don't, you don't get the benefits of things like indexes. Um, you don't get a fancy query language, but yeah. So if you want to find that user by their first name, now you're you're in trouble. Yeah, I mean you need to look. You need to save that separately mm-hmm. as a you know kind of create your own index. So right. it's, there's definitely a bit of a hurdle in that sense. Mm-hmm. But um, if if the indexing isn't a huge piece for you, or if you're a lot of times people index using something like Elasticsearch, you know some full text search engine. Actually, there's another one called Believe that'll use a bolt underneath. Uh, people are going to attach onto that and do their searches through that. So uh, it, it depends on the use case. Again, you know, right tool for the right job. But uh, it, I treat a lot. I treat them kind of similarly to a, uh-huh. a relational database. And when you think about relational databases too, they store their rows that they have in there are just an encoded data structure that has a row ID that points to it. So they're almost like they're almost um, 
what's the word, key value stores underneath. They right. just have kind of a relational layer on top. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And then when it comes to um, back to the operational simplicity side of things, you're just storing you're just storing all this in a file on disk, right? It's very SQLite in that sense. Yeah, single file. Yeah, it's pretty uh pretty straightforward. Pretty straightforward. So that you know, backups, um, moving things around, copying data. It's you know if you <laughs> use your use your Linux your Unix tools, right? Oh yeah, pretty, uh, pretty much. I mean, there's some some locking stuff, so you have to go through. But you can, it'll be actually be a transactional copy inside the database. So you start a transaction, you can stream it out. But it's it'll go as fast as your operating system or your SSD can, you know, read the data off. So it, it goes pretty snappy. And it sounds like you've gotten that into a scenario that says both currently in high load production environments serving databases as large as one terabyte. Yep. So even in that case, you just have one one terabyte file sitting there. Uh, sometimes we'll split off. Um, We'll split off into multiple partitions, okay. uh, but that's more of a, a load balancing thing. It was actually at Shopify, we created a, an analytics database that was clustered, and uh, we had multiple Bolt partitions on each, running on each one, and then we could copy them around and redistribute the load as we needed it to. But we, used something, we used consistent hashing inside of there to be able to redirect requests to the correct partition. Very cool. Well, this sounds like a good spot to stop here from one of our awesome sponsors. When we get back... I'm going to talk to you about some more use cases, maybe compare it to a few other key value stores, uh, Level, DB, um, others may, people might be familiar with, Memcached, uh, Redis, such things. So stick around and we'll be right back. Imagix is a real-time image processing proxy in CDN. And let me tell you, this is way more than image magic running on EC2. This is way better. It's everything your friend and developers have dreamt of. Output to PNG, JPEG, GIF, JPEG 2000, and several other formats. And if you're like me, and you've ever argued with your boss or a teammate about serving retina images to non-retina devices, you'll appreciate their open source dependency-free JavaScript library that allows you to easily use the ImageX API to make your images responsive to any device. Now, all of this takes a platform, and the ImageX platform is built on three core values. Flexibility and quality, performance, and affordability. When it comes to flexibility and quality, ImageX has over 90 URL parameters that you can mix and match to provide an unlimited amount of transformations that you need for your images. And they take quality very seriously. And because of their commitment to high quality, The Guardian, Eventbrite, Kickstarter, Quiz up and many more trust them to serve their images. Now, when it comes to performance, Imagix operates out of data centers filled with top of the line Mac Pros and Mac Minis, and they're set up for a completely streaming solution. This means your images never hit the disk. Images are served by the best SSD based CDM for delivery around the world anywhere extremely fast. And while we're talking about speed, almost all the image processing happens on GPUs. This means transformations are super fast when compared to competing virtualized environments. And lastly, it's all about affordability. Everyone wants to save a buck. That's how the world works. And because ImageX processes close to a billion with a B images per day, they're able to make certain optimizations at scale and pass those savings on to you. To learn more about ImageX and what they're all about, head to imgix.com. Once again, imgix.com and tell them Adam from the Change Log sent you. All right, we are back with Ben Johnson talking all things open source databases, specifically at this moment, Bolt DB, which is Ben's popular key value store uh, in the Go ecosystem. Ben, we were talking about use cases. Can you give us uh, kind of how it's being used in the wild and maybe uh, some projects that are built on top of Bolt? Yeah, sure. Uh, I, think it's, I think it's largely used by um, projects that, you know, want, a lot of times it's for projects that have uh, like, a key, like a data store they need inside of there, but that's not, you know, it's not the main focus of the application where they have, you know, it's not like a web app where some giant database is sitting behind it and people are using it. Right. So I think it's getting towards that. But I think a lot of cases tend to be it's storing metadata or like smaller sets of data 
currently. Uh, there are there are definitely some exceptions to that. Um, there's a, a guy named TV. He wrote Bazil, which is like a uh, it's like distributed file system, like for your like personal file system kind of drop boxes. Uh, but he's using Bolt for that. Um, he's been he's actually been around for a long time. When I first wrote Bolt, I put it out there, or not even put it out there. I just had it as a, a repo. He just came along one day and was just like going line by line through the code and like being, "This is wrong. This is wrong." What? <laughs> you know, you gotta, I mean, in the, the most friendly way. He'd tell me how to fix it. Uh-huh. Me, give me links to like low level like Unix um, documentation. Yeah. So he definitely helped uh, to stabilize Bolt. So huge shout out to him. Um, I know that um, at Heroku, there's um, they have some log stuff that that runs through uh, through Bolt or uses Bolt in mm-hmm. some capacity. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, there's definitely some some cool projects out there that people are using it for. So in addition to that, it seems like whenever you talk about key values, there are a few common use cases. Specifically, thinking about web apps, uh, that's kind of where I, my mind goes as I'm a you know web developer by trade. So um, caching is a big one. Um, mm-hmm. background jobs seems like those cues mm-hmm. are pretty good scenarios. Um, there are tools out there that do such things. I, I mentioned them before the break, uh, memcached and also Redis. Can you kind of compare and contrast to those if you're familiar with them? Sure. And yeah. How good, how good would Bolt be at those particular jobs? Well, so memcached is meant to be, if, if I understand it correctly, is it's an in-memory cr- cache. So there's not, I don't think there's a backing store on it. Yeah, it's, uh, it's been a, right? yeah, it's been a long time since I've used that. But yeah, so I mean, if you you can store data in there all day, but it's meant to just be a layer uh, to quit hit hit quickly. But you can always fall back to the the underlying data store. So Bolt, in contrast, would actually it writes all the data to disk safely. Even in the event of a crash, it'll come back up. And if you've committed a transaction, that transaction will be there. Uh, if you look at something like Redis, on the other hand, uh, it has it has I think two different persistence layers. They have like a um, like a write-ahead log and a snapshot, I think. Right. I, I could, could totally be butchering this. But, uh, yeah, I mean, Redis, it stands at kind of a higher layer. They have a key value, you know, piece in there. Right. But I know they have a whole bunch of other data structures <laughs> they do as well. Yeah, I mean, but, as far as com- complexity goes, Redis has, you know, lists and sets and mm-hmm. different objects and stuff. Yeah, which is which is really cool. There's mm-hmm. They don't have a sense of a transaction, though. So I think if you're doing, if you really want strong transactions, which I think... A lot of people don't realize how important that is. Like we get these kind of weird, inconsistent states when we're trying to write ten keys, but we only write eight of them. And you know what happened to those last two? And we try to resolve that by you know writing jobs to kind of fix it later on or check for it. Um, But if you can actually get strong serialization or serializable transactions, um, I think that goes a long way. So Bolt has transactions. Yeah, it's they're actually full acid. Serializable transactions. So can you like can you teach me that like I'm five? <laughs> can you just go through a transaction and tell us what that what that all implies? Sure. So you start a transaction. Um, you can do read transactions or write transactions. Uh, write transactions you can only have one at a time, so they all go sequentially. Um, they're, seri- they're serialized. Uh, read transactions can start on and off whenever they want. You can have multiple at the same time, and they'll all go off at the same um, kind of that point in time when the transaction started. Uh, so the actual write transactions, they will kind of give you a space to work in, and you can change data and rewrite those keys and values or create buckets. Um, and then when it goes to commit it, it'll take those those pages it wrote, and it'll write all the pages out, and it'll write a new meta page. And it kind of has this almost like a, if you've ever done like graphic stuff, it has like basically a double buffer for mm. your uh, for your meta page. So it has to write all the data first and then it writes a new meta page to point to that new data. And it, the transaction is not committed until it writes that single last uh, meta page. So it has this interesting piece to it where it's, there's not like a, it's not recovery. Like you get mm-hmm. in a lot of databases, like if it crashes, it'll just start back up with whatever data is committed. There's no, it doesn't have to reread a log to, you know, reapply changes. Mm-hmm. It's just wherever it was. And it has this, this unique safety property which is really nice. So the I don't know if that's in depth enough, or you want some some more details. <laughs> no, that was pretty good. Okay. So that sounds like I mean, and you implemented all that yourself. So that sounds like uh, sounds like something that is a nice thing to have, especially for um, something that you're going to be building on top of. Sounds like a feature that um, 
it's definitely not unique to Bolt, but as far as key values go, um, I think that's a nice to have, right? Or that's that's kind of even a you got to have that, right? Well, you you think you got to have it, but like serializable transactions, uh-huh. um, they're not, they're not even the default on a lot of relational databases. I think they're actually read committed transactions. There's all kinds of different like, isol- different isolation levels, right? And it's honestly hard to remember all of the little sure nuances. Uh, but serializable transactions means you you can't read anything that's been committed or, or anything in another transaction that's been committed already, um, but ha- didn't get committed before the transaction started. You kind of get this whole uh, view of the view of the database uh-huh. and kind of it's, it's it's basically how you think of transactions like in your head normally it's like i have the safe world where everything is you know how i expect it to be that's right. a serializable transaction there's a lot of other ones that try to make um make trade-offs for performance or speed yeah yeah where you can kind of like you can read things that have been committed in another transaction before it's before this one or after this one started but before it stopped it's it's confusing honestly <laughs> But if you think of transactions, it's it's probably what you'd expect. Yeah. But yeah, so it's it's it is um, it's really useful to have that safety. Uh, and I tried to try to pare down Bolt to really be like the core things that I needed. Like LMDB had a lot of other features uh, around performance where you could write stuff directly into the database instead of going through some other safety uh, measures. And they had some other trade offs they made. But mm-hmm. I tried to like cut out all those extra pieces. So it ended up being like two thousand lines of code. Which I don't know if that sounds like a lot or not. For a, for a database, it's tiny. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, it sounds like a lot if I was just going to sit down and code that day. But <laughs> for a database, it doesn't sound like too much. Yeah, so I mean, LMDB, I think, is about 8,000 lines. If you look at like LevelDB, I think it's around uh, 20,000 lines. LevelDB is very similar to Bolt. It's out of Google. And yeah, it seems so, like there are some, some differences. Yeah, so that's an LSM tree. So that'll do okay. like the, the right optimized. Whereas, so you could, you could write stuff into... Level DB much faster than you can in Bolt, but if you're looking to do like range scans, we have like a set of data in order that you're trying to go across. Bolt will be much faster than Level DB. Awesome. So that's Bolt in a nutshell. Um, great readme, by the way. Got to give you respect for going oh, into great detail there. Um, GitHub.com/slash/BoltDB/slash/Bolt. Check out the readme. Uh, ben goes through not just usage and. Um, backups and stuff, but he actually goes through comparison with other databases. Um, he'll talk about the LSM tree versus the B tree, when you should use which one. There's even caveats and limitations. Lots to be had there. Check out Bolt, um, a low-level key-value store that's simple on purpose and sounds like it's uh, a rock. It's been production-ready since November of last year. And people are picking it up. So check that out. I think we should switch gears a little bit and talk about the next one. I know we had a list of a ton of databases. <laughs> we just got to pick a couple because we don't have too much time. The next is the one that you seem to be working with um, either in a consulting capacity or full time. But InfluxDB, which is open source as well, but is also has a business built around it. Can you tell us about Influx? Sure, yeah. It's a, it's a time series database. And we really sit around being um, easy to get up and running. Uh, we have clustering in there. We can actually spread it across a lot of machines. Uh, and then we're we're building out of a lot of new functionality now for um, doing a lot of like write ahead log stuff for uh, write optimization and doing compression in there to shrink down the size of the database. Um, so it's it's coming along. People have really been interested in it as far as just again, it's like it's one of those simple databases that you know we have. We use Bolt underneath, mm-hmm. so there's no other service to get up and running. You know, I know some other things have um, relied on Redis or some other data stores in the past. Some actually, a lot of them rely on um, Cassandra in the mm-hmm. background mm-hmm. that kind of push that off to there. Uh, but we, it's really just one binary. You just download and just start up. So that's yes, yeah, it's, it's been great in that sense. People have been really interested. So, as far as time series databases go. Um, I don't have much of a context besides um, speaking with Julius Vols about Prometheus, mm-hmm. which at its core is has a time series database. And I know there's some Prometheus uses Bolt here or there. I'm curious about if it uses Influx or or not. But are there other time series databases out there that people can pick up and use, or is is this uh, a brand new thing? No, uh, there's been time series databases out there, um, but. The funny thing with time series databases is that, especially some of the older ones, is that they're just notoriously difficult to get up and running. Mm. Um, and a lot of people, 
will actually pick up influx more or less. I mean, initially out of frustration, just they spent <laughs> three hours trying to get right. graf- graphite running or something like that, uh-huh. and they just they gave up. So I mean, it's it's interesting, like the the technical decisions you make along the way about what dependencies you might need and how those dependencies change over time and what how that makes a project easier hard to get up and running. Uh, so yeah, that's. It's not a new thing by any means. Right. I think there's a lot of ease of use stuff. We have a query language in there. Uh, we do a lot around like um, the way people can retain data long term and how they roll it up and how they can move it around. Uh, so there's a lot of thought that's put in that too. So let's uh, maybe zoom out a second and talk about time series as a thing. When would I uh, reach for this type of a data store? The only the, the one I can think of off the top of my head is like analytics. But are there other use cases for time series data stores? Sure, yeah. I mean, analytics is a big one. Uh, right. Monitoring has been another big one as well. Um, a lot of people have sensor data. That's actually been a big growing one where mm-hmm. they need. And it's, there's some weird use cases with sensor data as well. Um, there's one where it's a, there's a company that has sensors, but they don't send data continuously. They store it up, and then every, like, four hours, they send off the data. And for some reason, some databases, they can't. They, do, they expect kind of a stream of data coming in, and stuff will get dropped off if it's too late. Or out of order, or certain things mm. like that. So there's um, sensor data has been a big one as well. So I, th- I think between those three, those are probably the main ones. Yeah, I can like, see it also with like uh, streaming financial transactions and uh, mar- yep. market stuff. Yeah, that's another one too. Yeah, any I mean anything that's going to have a real time stream of data, and you're going to be either capturing it or aggregating um, points in time, you know, to to use later. Mm-hmm. Seems like that's kind of where these things play. Yeah, it's one of those things too. It's it's one of those use cases that's grown large enough where people have started writing databases specifically for it. And mm-hmm. when you have, if you try to put it into something like MySQL, I mean, MySQL has a ton of, you know, ton of features on there for relational access and indexes and all kinds of stuff. But mm-hmm. if you really just have a timestamp and a value or a set of values, and that's the data that you have going in, there's much better ways you can optimize that in a, a specific store. Mm. So Influx is both an open source project and a company. I'm not sure what the product is, if it's a services, if it's a, a pro plan. Um, how does the business side break apart from the open source side with Influx? Yeah, so the, the business side, we have a, a managed hosted product over okay. there as well. Um, and we do a lot of, uh, we have some SLA stuff as well for more enterprise customers. Mm-hmm. And those have been the big pushes too. We have some stuff coming down the line as well. But uh I think that's more hush hush. Okay. <laughs> so, but yeah, so the uh, people have been pretty excited too about having kind of a roadmap of where Influx is going uh-huh. and what we're doing with that. I think a lot of times uh, some businesses have been hesitant with other open source projects if they don't know the long term. You know, like if they want to build a product on top of Influx, yeah, you know, they want to know that there's a company there and that you know they have funding and they it's have not gonna disappear. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, because. Yeah, sometimes, you know, projects do uh, kind of go into the ether. Right. Yeah, and I guess, the, the, you know, whenever we have a business divide and, and an open source divide, we start to wonder about licenses, by the way. Uh, Changelog listeners who always are asking us, talk more about licenses. Uh-huh. Um, Bolt is MIT mm-hmm. licensed. Um, how does Influx's license break out? Yeah, Influx is also, I believe, either MIT or BSD. And they, uh, honestly, the... One of the reasons I came on originally with them is that both the uh, the founders are just awesome, laid back, cool guys mm-hmm. that love open source. That Paul Paul Dix has been involved with Ruby, on the Ruby side for a long time, okay. um, and then you know they're they're very focused on putting out stuff and being in the community and being um, and talking to people on Twitter or on GitHub uh-huh. and getting people involved. Um, so I really like that about them. And but they don't have a restriction around uh, like a, a GPL license or anything like that. Okay. So they've been pretty open about it all. I know there's been some contention about whether you should do like a, a dual license or, or how all that lays out. I'm kind of anti GPL personally. Okay. But um, I'm sure that's going to start a flame war right there. <laughs> well, did, oh, why? Tell us why. Uh, you know, I think the thing is. Um, I guess I shouldn't say anti GPL. If it works for you, that's great. Mm-hmm. Um, for me personally, I like to I like to make things, mm-hmm. and I like to be able to just put them out there in the world, and people can kind of riff off that and do something with it if they want to, or they could go 
you know, build a company out of it. You know, right. if, I can, if I can do something that'll somehow make value in the world, I think that's awesome. But if I see, whenever I see something that's GPL, you know, I don't know if I'm ever going to want to do something in that realm again. I don't want to worry about um, some derivative work issue coming along later on. Right. So if I see GPL, I honestly just close down the project. Like I don't even look at the project because I don't know. Just like that. Yeah, just like that. I mean, I hate to even say that because I think people have done great work. That is GPL. But, yeah. you know, there are a lot of businesses that just simply can't use it. Right. You know, and some people may want to use it in a business capacity. I don't know. There's, there's all kinds of yeah. hoops that just kind of make me skittish personally. Yeah, I'm, I'm, of, I'm of two minds, as I am on many things. <laughs> um, I can see both sides. And uh, I, I personally MIT license almost everything I do. That mm-hmm. being said, like, I'm mostly putting out small things that are, I think, you know, trivial. Um, mm-hmm. Not like run. I mean, even your Bolt DB is more ambitious, and and because its infrastructure is more likely to be included in you know commercial products than anything that I built open source. So if I had a more substantial, bigger thing, I might put more thought into it personally. Um, but yeah, I mean, I can see how the GPL limits adoption, absolutely, mm-hmm. and how you know there's a lot of noise in open source, especially now more than ever. <laughs> um, it's hard to. Uh, let the cream rise to the top, uh, so to speak. Mm-hmm. Um, that's you know one of our missions with the change log is to shine the light on open source, like the little guys who are doing cool things, but you know their voice gets drowned out in the crowd. Is like we like to shine a light on that um, because we realize that there's a lot of noise, and so d- putting a GPL license on your thing makes it harder for it to um, to take off, like it would with a more liberal license. Yeah. That being said, I also understand the side where it's like. <laughs> You know, companies are um, are just profiting off of my work, and and, and yeah. I, I, I get that. I get that too. Yeah. So it's it's tough. Um, yeah, I had a discussion with Mike, or just a small Twitter discussion with Mike Perham. Uh-huh. Is that how you say his last name, Perham? Yep. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I mean, I, it seems like the GPL, the dual license is working for him with Sidekick. Yep. Uh, so I mean, I I certainly I don't want to knock it by any means. I I mean, I think there's definitely a, a use case out there for it. Yeah, and we've had Mike on the show a few times. Um, you know, he's he's been unique in the ability to turn a popular open source project into a business, um, mm-hmm. a lifestyle business, not a you know VC funded larger thing, and has a lot of opinions on not just licensing but also the sustainability of open source and you know how to make it work for you. And so, um, I'll just submit that for the listeners if you're interested in that topic. I don't have episode numbers on me, but go to changelog.com slash podcast and just search in page for the word Mike or Param. You'll find some interesting uh, episodes on that. Yeah, I mean, it's when it comes to licensing, it's something that we all have to wrestle with uh, as we put our software out there is, you know, what are our priorities um, and what do we feel comfortable with? So yeah, everybody's got to make their own decision on that front. Yeah, it's, it's a minefield, though. It really is, yeah. <laughs> Um, so back to influx just a little bit. Um, it's at zero nine two. So, um, you know, not quite a 1.0, but it seems mm-hmm. like it's out there and gaining steam. Um, mm-hmm. anything else about influx DB that you want to hit on before we move on? Um, you know, we're just, yeah, I mean, we just keep working at it. I mean, I know that there are, you know, I think, yeah, I think it's, it's just a product that's continually evolving and improving. So, I think that if people have tried it in the past, you know, we've done a lot to to improve upon it. So I hope people try it again. Certainly. Awesome. All right. We'll take our second break. When we get back, I want to talk to you about something a little bit different, which is um, I'll just leave it as the secret lives of data. Let's just leave it right there and we'll peel that apart when we get back. Guess what, everyone? We've partnered with Casper, the online retailer of premium mattresses to give you $50 towards your new mattress. The mattress industry has inherently forced consumers, myself included, into paying notoriously high markups, and Casper has revolutionized the mattress industry by cutting the cost of dealing with resellers and showrooms, and they pass those savings directly onto you. Their mattress is a one of a kind. It's a new hybrid mattress that combines premium latex foam with memory foam. And the Casper experience was designed with you in mind and optimized for sleep. And this is my favorite part. It's backed by a 100-night 
no hassle return policy with full refund and a 10 year warranty. And what's even cooler is how they ship this mattress to you. It comes in a box that couldn't possibly fit a mattress. And when you open it, the mattress unravels for you to lay down and catch some Z's. Head to casper.com slash changelog and use the code changelog when you check out to get $50 towards your new mattress. Enjoy. All right, we are back with Ben Johnson talking open source databases. And perhaps somewhat related is this really cool thing called the Secret Lives of Data. That's the secret lives of data.com. We'll link it up in the show notes. Um, where he explains a thing called Raft in a cool visual way. Ben, can you tell us about this? Yeah, sure. So the Secret Lives of Data is just meant to be a project where um, I feel like there's a lot of like distributed systems and database topics and computer science topics that like I honestly feel like you can explain any of those topics with like circles and lines and motion. Like right. that's kind of whenever you go on a whiteboard, you're like, this is this server here and it sends right. it over here and does that. But we don't kind of have that. We have books with static images. And um, I feel like there's just kind of this, there's a piece that's lacking, especially with so many new like distributed databases and um, all these kind of systems design things that people we need to learn about. But it's, you know, like research papers and it's, you know, these books that come out that are kind of, they're kind of tough to sink in. Mm-hmm. So I wanted to find something in some way that was easily digestible to explain complicated topics. Like uh, like distributed consensus, for example, is not like the easiest topic to, <laughs> to explain to someone. Uh, but if you can step through it piece by piece and kind of show some motion with it, I think it, I think people tend to you know pick it up. I've had a lot of people actually mention that you know they read through the paper a couple of times, but it didn't click until they saw this visualization of it. So to explain what it actually is, it's it's kind of a data visual. It's a uh, it's almost like a motion graphic. Uh-huh of how Raft and distributed consensus, so this protocol called Raft, uh, implements distributed consensus where you have a set of nodes, like a uh, like a cluster of computers, and they need to agree on some value and how that happens and how it changes over time. And if you get a, like a split in your network, you know, what happens to the different sets of nodes and, you know, how does it avoid situations where some nodes think that they might have one value, another might think it has value. Right. Uh, so there's all these like edge cases that you don't think about that are kind of hard to wrap your head around, but I try to explain that visually. So, and it does a great job, by the way. This is oh, thank you. incredibly impressive. And I actually, I came across this, I don't know when you launched this, but I think I, it hit my, my feeds then. Hmm. I didn't know who did it at the time, but then when I started uh, doing some research into it, I was like, oh man, he did this. That's pretty <laughs> cool. So uh, where's the motivation behind, you know, sinking the time into this? Do you have some sort of, do you have an educational background or... Um, what what made you what made you want to do this? Uh, I, mean, I think I just I like I know that some people people have put out so many great resources that mm-hmm. I've learned from. Like um, I know you've had Ilya Gregorik, is that yep. how you say his name, on the show a bunch. Yep. Uh, when I first got into like writing databases, like every time I'd find some concept that I wanted to learn about, I'd like type it into Google, and he'd have like the first page on there with his blog about some obscure topic, right? About, like Bloom filters or whatever. Yeah, exactly. And like I always see these. You know, and he sunk so much time into his blog to explain these great things that I learned from. I feel like, you know, what's some way I can give back? And mm-hmm. uh, like I knew, I knew Raft really well. I've implemented implementations in it, and uh, yeah, I just I was trying to think of a great way to kind of visualize that and show it. And at first, I thought it was going to be like a week, you know, and I'd be done. <laughs> How long? Did and, it take? Uh, I think it was like a month and a half. Wow! And it was, I, I ended up writing. I wrote it in D3, but D3 uh-huh. doesn't have a way to, like, stop motion, like, partway through. Okay. So I actually had to write my own kind of timers and framework on how I was going to, like, structure stuff. And I essentially wrote, like, a Raft implementation in JavaScript that I could run inside. Because <laughs> if you play the, the visualization twice, it'll actually be different the second time. Okay. And, the you know, the way the, the nodes shoot off. And, yeah, so um, it was a huge pain. So uh, I actually, it's been kind of sitting idle for a little while Uh but uh i ended up taking a while off and learning this program called after effects from adobe Mm -hmm. which actually does like motion graphics and because i thought there had to be an easier way and there is like (laughs) people do this for a living like they write you know uh, it's almost like a flash but you can generate video and okay do all kinds of stuff people use it for special effects in movies a lot and uh so yeah i want to start doing stuff as originally i was going to do kind of like five minute videos 
for things like uh, Apache Kafka or you know Cassandra or all these more complicated databases and how they work yeah. under the cover, you know, yeah. and, underneath. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, so I spent like three or four months learning After Effects and reading books and watching videos on it. Um, and then I, I ran out of time to, to actually make the <laughs> the visualizations. Mm. But, but the uh, I realized also, originally I was going to do these five-minute videos, but then I kind of realized later on, like, people, like snippets seem to be much more easily digestible. So I, I'm thinking about doing a smaller format of, like, 20 second like animated gifs mm. that i can post up to twitter and that's it seems like it'd be able to spread a little better you just click on it learn about you know how apache kafka works in 30 seconds you know yeah so we'll see if that works but that's my goal right now i love it i mean i would say that you know just to exhort you to continue in these efforts because i think it is a powerful way of teaching and um you know, maybe not to give up completely on your your um, the, the work you put in to build this one. I don't know if there's if maybe it's just too crazy, but if you could get some sort of a a framework in place to where you could do other things more easily, then you could start to have an infrastructure for other people building out these types of things on the web. Um, that That's being true. said, animated gifs uh, people <laughs> people love those. So. People love them. Man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Although it's strange to find one that's useful, you know. <laughs> it is, yeah. I think it would probably be the first one. They're usually just good ever. at like <laughs> displaying some sort of emotion or surprise, but uh, but yeah, the first useful animated GIF. Maybe you get it on Wikipedia yeah. for that. Maybe. I hope know? so. That'd be my <laughs> my entry. <laughs> awesome. Well, we'll link that up in the show notes, uh, Ben. I think it's time to go to our awesome closing questions, mm-hmm. um, and we will ask the first one, which is become somewhat compulsory these days um which is who is your programming hero uh, i would have to say Ilya gregoric i just learned so much from that guy from his blog um and i would totally just i would be his groupie totally if he was at a conference i'd just follow him <laughs> all around the whole time i have to give my amen on that one he's influenced <laughs> he's influenced me quite a bit in my uh development and uh you know, I don't get too nervous for these shows, but with Ilya for the first time, I was kind of like, you know, had that like, oh man, this guy's so smart. I hope <laughs> I don't sound like a dope interviewing him. Uh, yeah, he's awesome. Shout out to Ilya out there. Very cool. Um, next one is open source radar. So if you had a weekend and you were just going to hack on some stuff, you weren't working on your After Effects things, but some new project, something that's interesting to you, um, what is it? Uh, it's not even necessarily a new project, but the new stuff going into uh, like the Go standard library and the Go toolchain, I think it's just been fascinating. There's just been like a lot of the stuff around the garbage collection, and then um, this is an actually standard library, but GoFuzz is another one that came out recently, where it's just kind of like fuzz testing and uh, just making really solid libraries that are you know well tested against all kinds of you know crazy incoming data. So I'd say those two. Very good. Very good. Okay, last one for you is if you weren't uh, an op- awesome open source developer working on these database tools and whatnot, if you weren't doing this, uh, what else would you be doing? Oh, man, that's a tough question right there. Um, hmm. You know, actually, this is going to be a kind of a cop-out answer, but I started doing the startup thing for several years. Mm-hmm. Like I was going to make a company and do all this stuff. Right. And I eventually stopped doing that because I came to this realization that if I made a bunch of money, I'd just go write open source all day <laughs> for my free time. So I can't think of what else I'd be doing, honestly, with my free time. Um, I think I might just go on hikes. we got some awesome stuff around here in Colorado. So I think I'd just hike for, like, be a tour guide, maybe. <laughs> that works. That works. I love that. So you're like, well, if I can make a bunch of money, then I can go do open source for the rest of my days. You're like, wait a second. Wait, I can do that right I now. I can just do open source right now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Awesome. <laughs> Well, one thing to mention uh, before we say goodbye is that uh, we've been doing a film series, Changelog Films, at all of the, not all of the, but many uh, developer conferences. So um, we call it Beyond Code. We ask similar questions to the ones that we ask for our closing questions. In fact, Programming Hero is featured in that series as well. Two different developers of all shapes and sizes at the after parties of different conferences. It's really cool. I want you to check it out. We just finally launched the website um, because we've had the videos forever, but you know, 
the uh, the cobblers kids have no shoes. So <laughs> making a website for ourselves, you know, was a lot of work. Um, but we're pretty proud of it. We want you to check it out. It's at beyondcode.tv. Right now we have season one up. That was at Keep Ruby Weird last fall. We have seasons two, three, and four also in the can. So those videos will be showing up there shortly. Um, check it out, beyondcode.tv. Let us know what you think. And I uh, just want to say thanks to you, Ben, for joining us. Uh, it's a really good conversation. I'm excited about Bolt DB and all these cool new things coming out of the Go ecosystem. I want to give a shout out to our ChangeLog members and our awesome sponsors for the show, helping make it happen. Don't forget to tune in next week when Karen Meyer joins us to talk about closure. Check that out. And until then, we'll see you. Thanks for having me, Jared.